SRO Magazine presents the legendary rock vocalist, Paul Shortino. Paul Shortino. He was lead vocalist for bands like Rough Cut, King Cobra, Quiet Riot, and his own Shortino. Paul Sortino calls into the Carson Drive studio to talk to SRO Magazine's own rock and roll reporter, Burr. Burr. Hey man. Hello, gorgeous. There's lots to talk about, so let's get to, get to, get to the interview. This is Ferg with SRO Magazine, your number one source for music and entertainment news and interviews. We are so very lucky to be able to talk to rock and roll legend Paul Shortino. He's one of the greatest vocalists in rock and roll history. He's fronted iconic bands, was in the movie Spinal Tap, was also in the uh, hearing aid back in the 80s. But now he is taking his immeasurable talents to Las Vegas as he stars in the number one rated show in Las Vegas, Raiding the Rock Vault. And it's all about the history of classic rock. So, Mr. Paul Shortino, with all the history you've created in rock and roll, how did you become part of the number one show in Vegas, Raiding the Rock Vault? Uh, it was, uh, I was asked to do a uh, honky tonk woman. So uh, they sent me the file. I, uh, met John Payne at Ronnie James Dio's memorial. And he had been spending two years of his life putting this, raiding the rock vault, which is the story of classic rock, uh, together. So then shortly after I did this song, he, he made a trip up here and stayed at the Hard Rock and asked me if I'd be interested in doing uh, a show based on the history of classic rock. And I said, sure, I'm in. So uh, next thing I knew, we had a rehearsal up in um, Los Angeles around March or uh, December 18th, right before the end of the world. Like 2012, the Mayans? According to the Mayans. And we actually right. filmed the uh, sizzle of this uh, idea at the uh, Mayan Theater. So <laughs> I traveled from Las Vegas up to Los Angeles, and they had already been rehearsing for like 15 days. And Joe Lynn Turner from Rainbow showed up the same day. So we had one day rehearsal with the guys. So basically, we got what was left over material-wise because they had been rehearsing for, you know, like up to 15 to 16 days. Right. And we didn't know what we were getting into. Just a bunch of, you know, old rock guys and, and, and rehearsing cover songs. Then we went to the theater and then we saw all of the lasers and the story behind. Because there's actors and actresses in the show. Uh, and the stories behind uh, all the footage of the, all the bands that we're doing. There's like 30, 38 songs, I think, in the show. Really? 30? Wow. There's some, me there's some medleys. Basically, the theater, the stage is set up like a Mayan temple with uh, palm trees and, you know. Then, then there's the rock vault, which is used as a stargate to... Uh, Basically, they introduce us at the beginning of the show, and then they, the first song of the show is uh, My Generation, and uh, it gives a story of the Who, and then I come out and do Light My Fire, and then they give some, there's five screens, and then they give, you know, some story and history on each band that we do a song of, there is a a bit of story. So for young people, it's a history lesson of rock and roll because we start in 1960, I think it's probably four, 65, and we end in 1989. So we, we start with living on a prayer in the eighties and then we end with jump the show's last song, but we do a medley of some Robert Palmer, ATDC, Survivor, CZ Top, Jukebox era. We've had guests like John Anderson from Yes, where we had to learn three Yes songs. We had Lou Graham from Porter, Mickey Thomas from Starship, Joe Lynn Turner, Bobby Kimball. So we've learned to add to the show when we bring in a guest like uh, Billy Gibbons, Sammy Hager, uh, even David Coverdale, since we've added uh, Doug Aldridge to the uh, lineup. David 
Coverdale wants to come and be a guest, so we'll see what happens. How cool would that be? A lot of people want to come and be a guest once they see how the show is. I mean, that's just name after name of legends, rock and roll legends coming in. That's so cool. Oh, yeah. Yeah, You know, and there's no um, backing tracks. We do um, everything live. Everything is live. And I mean, you can do that. You have literally some of the greatest musicians in the world in the band with you. I, you're an, you're a legendary singer, but I know you also play guitar. Do you do some of that in the show as I'm well? I play guitar on Watchtower, the 12 string. Um, and then I, we, I play a six string again on Hotel California and, and, and sing with, with, we do an ensemble. Uh, there's only a few songs where uh, there's just individuals like I'll do. I'll do some Stones and I do uh, Jim Morrison. And then the rest of the material is uh, either uh, a medley and we're doing just a little bit of a song or we're doing DeWitt with each other. So it's, uh, it, it's there's only a few songs that every uh, singer does by himself and then there's a, a, a numerous amount of songs that we do collectively well you're going to do 38 songs with rock and roll legends so i think you're going to have something for for pretty much everybody who comes hey i hear you're on the same stage elvis was absolutely really absolutely and every night we go and see where elvis used to stand there's a bullet hole in the elevator where elvis shot the, uh, the elevator one night John had a studio underneath the stage, and that was a room where Elvis used to take all of his uh, sweet little girls that he wanted to have fun with. <laughs> really? Really? Well, he was the king, baby. You know what I'm saying? He was the king. Hey, of all the songs you got, you mentioned that you play uh, 38 songs. Of all the songs, what is uh, the favorite song that you've played so far? In the show. You know, I never thought I, uh, I, when I was 17 years old, a guy told me I should do Jim Morrison. And I really love doing Like My Fire. Honky Tonk Woman, I get to do Paul Shortino. I do a little bit in the front, the front, like Jack Ahmed, uh, Jim Dope, and then I go to, you know, I get to be, I get to go into Paul Shortino. That's so excellent. I would say that Honky Tonk's one of my favorites. And, um, here I go again uh, from a White Snake. I, I like doing that in the, in the medley, and I also do Dream On. So I I, I, I like those songs, but my, I think my favorite two are actually uh, uh, I Like My Fire and Honky yeah. Tonk Woman. Well, I've heard uh, Honky Tonk Woman. It's on uh, Rating the Rock Vault Songs from the Vault Volume One, and you can get that on iTunes. And you absolutely tear that song up. I was uh, in prepping for this interview. I was, you know, listening to some King Cobra and stuff like that. And I was listening to the EPK on uh, YouTube. And Carmine Peace, the legendary drummer, says that Paul Shortino knows everyone in Vegas. Said it's backstage. You know everybody. Is that true? Do you know well, everyone? I've, uh, I've really been fortunate enough to uh, get in with some of the show people. And it was through a, a, a very talented uh, gentleman here in uh, Las Vegas, his name's Frankie Marino, and he plays piano. He was playing piano at 10 years old. He was on Star Search, and and they just didn't have a category for him because he was playing classical piano, so he went home and learned how to sing. So I actually met him through his guitarist, Russ Letitia, and uh, sat in one night doing a, a song by Etta James called At Last. All of a sudden, I stepped out of the rock and roll click in Las Vegas. I stepped into the show people. All of a sudden, it opened different doors for me uh, because there's a, you know there, there's so many talented people here in Las Vegas that really people don't know how talented some of these people are and somehow incredible some of these shows are. So then I got to meet some of the people from surf shows and a lot of magic shows. Uh, Anthony Cools, who does a uh, hypnosis show where he gets people up to do crazy sexual things. He had a guy up there one night who was six feet tall, and he told him his hind end was on fire. <laughs> really? He was around on the stage trying to put it out. 
Uh, another great artist uh, that was actually um, on America's Got Talent, uh, a, a great uh, magician, uh, Murray Salchuk. I became really good friends with Carrot Top. Uh, Ron White uh, through Carrot Top. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a big fish in a small pond. And Vegas is a very small city, but it appears like a big city because there's always something going on. Um, you know, like uh, New York uh, brags about being the city that never sleeps, but Las Vegas never sleeps. You can go have sushi at four in the morning. You can have uh, tepin. Uh, you can go have a steak somewhere. I mean, you know, you can eat gourmet food all hours of the night. So to me, uh, it's the city that never sleeps. And you can go see entertainment all hours of the night. I love this town, and, and thank God it loves me. It's, uh, uh, that it's, is, uh, it's that's my awesome. wife's from this city. Okay. Her grandfather was an architect for Ben Siegel and did the Flamingo and the Mint and a lot of other uh, architectural uh, buildings here in the, in the city of Las Vegas and uh, was one of the founding fathers. So uh, he, wasn't, he was a gentleman's gentleman. He wasn't um, a gangster. As a businessman, you sometimes have to deal with people that, you know. Mike's actually putting together a book uh, with pictures of uh, a lot of the old Vegas people that started uh, Las Vegas and some of the uh, that'd be cool. Some of the mob people and Sinatra and all these people. Oh man, that'd be cool. I mean, there's such great characters out in Vegas. Now, in rating the rock Balls, speaking of characters, you have some outstanding musicians in the show, like uh, Howard Lee's on guitar. He's from uh, Heart and Bad Company. Also, Doug Aldridge on guitar, who, of course, was in White Snake, and, and you have one of my favorite singers of all time, Rob McCauley, in the show. He was, of course, the lead vocalist for uh, MSG and Survivor, and John Payne, who does lead vocals and bass and was in Asia, he uh, worked with uh, David Kirschenbaum to produce the show, right? Yes, this was John's idea as far as the, uh, the uh, putting this whole thing together, and... Um Kirsten Baum helped with some of it, yeah. Sir Harry Cow is the executive producer of the show. There's also Jay Schillen, who played with Bad Finger and also plays in Asia with John Payne. Right. Uh, Michael T. Ross, the keyboard player, uh, also was uh, playing with Lita Ford. And then we have the other singer, which is um, Andrew Freeman, who uh, performed with uh, Lynch Mob and also Offspring and just recently was doing some stuff with uh, the old uh, Ronnie James Dio uh, band uh, they called it Last in Line with Vivian Campbell uh -huh. and Bane and Denny and I think I've gotten everybody and we have a new addition to the show which is uh, two ladies uh, Carol Lynn Little who is in the uh, Monsters of Rock perform uh, a show here in Las Vegas, and also Stephanie Calvert, who is uh, plays with Nikki Thomas and Starship, are right. uh, performing some Fleetwood Mac, Heart, and uh, Benatar in the show. Excellent. I mean, more great songs by great bands in the show. And I guess uh, Rating the Rock Vault's going to be around for a while. You guys just signed a... Uh, long-term deal so congratulations oh yeah absolutely yeah uh last year the um, executive producers and investors put over five million dollars in the show and uh now the hotels picked up 75 percent of the advertisement and everything else that goes with it uh it's it's a lot to have a sh keep a show going in las vegas uh, the hotel uh, that we're at, the uh, where Elvis performed, uh, was the International. Then it became the Hilton. Now it's just the uh, LVH Hotel and Casino because uh, uh, Goldman Sachs owns that, and um, I believe they own the Stratosphere. So they actually had uh, the bankers had to come in and see, and they got the show. So we're still. Uh, Still uh, rocking, yeah. uh, rocking, and it's. Uh, are are they thinking about um, doing anything other than just in Las Vegas? They're thinking about going out and doing some tour dates, so that we can maybe do Broadway in New York and uh, somewhere in California, Tokyo. So people, they really can understand the show because it's quite. It's like 
15 concerts in one. It really is. Some people uh, that I, because we go out and meet everybody after the show and sign merch and stuff like that, and uh, a few people came up to me last, it was last night and um, the night before and said, you know, we've been to a lot of concerts, but this is the best concert we've ever been to because it's like going to a dozen concerts. Well, you have 38 songs, and, and I mean, some of the great rock and roll legends of different genres, and you're going, I can absolutely see why it would be seem like a dozen concerts. Plus, it's Vegas. It's going to have that that uh, huge production value. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a total history lesson for young people. The audience is 4 to 94. Well, I mean, with the variety that you have, it seems like that uh, you've got something we, for everyone. We did a night of champions, and it was Leon Spinks' uh, birthday. And uh, Meriwether showed up. Jake LaMotta showed up. There were just tons of... Uh, Sugar Lee Le- Le- Leonard showed up. Tons of boxers that showed up, and it was a great night. So we've had people all the way as far as Jake LaMotta was 94. We had him up on stage. Really? Jake LaMotta, the Raging Bull. How very, very cool. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, let's shift gears for a second and talk about King Cobra. Uh, You guys put out the King Cobra 2 album in 2013 to follow up, uh, I believe it was the 2011 album that they put together. You came in on vocals with, um, of course, Carmine Apiece, Johnny Rod, Mick Sweeta, and David Herzerling. How was this uh, album different than, than doing the first one? And how was it to get back together with all the guys after, you know, a little hiatus? The first one we did, which was a lot of their old material, this material, we actually spent a lot more time writing and not really caring how long the songs were. More like going back to the 70s. Well, in doing my research for this um, interview, I uh, I came across that you did all of the uh, vocals for the King Cobra 2 CD in your own studio, and that and it really got me to thinking, how does uh, a King Cobra album come together? I mean, what are the processes that are taking place? I mean, do you do drums, vocals? Well, we cut the drums uh, on, on tape, and we cut them in a studio here in Las Vegas hmm. that uh, you just recently moved to Cedar Point, Utah, but it was called Hit Track. And so Carmine cut the drums on tape with a click and... Uh, a kind of a skeleton arrangement of the, of the idea. We would send the drums to David, and then David would track his parts, and then they would send them back to me, and then I would do my parts or my write my parts. Some some of the things we wrote collectively. Um, some things um, we wrote individually, but was forced to kind of split stuff up because it was just better. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Uh, David uh, insisted on a couple songs. Okay. We, we were just going to split up everything equally, but David deserved it. He, uh, he, 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 he did a lot of writing, and, and, I, and so I... I I told Carmen, I'll, I'll get this up and everybody be happy and, well, and, and fight over this. What about touring? Uh, do you think King Cobra is going to go uh, on tour? We would love to, but it's Carmine's band. And hmm. Unfortunately, Carmine uh, has got so many things on his plate that, that sense. He, uh, I don't think he, 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 you know, this is probably, I, I would say that the last King Cobra record is probably the best stuff Carmine's done in a long time. He's doing a project with Joe Lynn Turner and Tony Franklin and I think it's called the X Project or Project X, and um, it's on Frontier. And uh, he, he's saying it sounds like uh, you know a new Blue Murder. <laughs> I hope so. Love Blue Murder. I, I hope so. But me too. You know, um, the supergroup days are, I think, are pretty much um, uh, something that's behind us. You know, because young people just don't know. Yeah, they don't know it, and 
and they're so fickle with the computers and everything else. Uh, well, it's a nonstop stream of, I mean, of technology and communication and music. music doesn't sound the same anymore. It, it, it doesn't feel the same. It doesn't it doesn't have an organicness to it. Well, anymore, you don't have to be organic. I mean, with the rise of MIDI and, and uh, sounds and sampling, it's... It's too digitalized. Uh, people could, don't even need to play an instrument to right. put out product. To me, uh, like they've got, I think there's another band called the Kings of Chaos with Slash, Duff McKagan, Steve Stevens, and uh, I think it's Glenn Hughes, and they're all out touring, but, you know, it's, uh, like I said, it's, what's the difference between raiding the rock vault and a bunch of super guys getting together and performing songs is that we have a story and it's a production. Right. It's a show. It's it, it, there, There's substance to it. It's not a bunch of guys getting up on stage, performing a bunch of different songs, and just having some lights. There's a whole story to it. There's actors and actresses. There's dancers in, the, in, in Raiding the Rock Hall. So it's more of a production than it is uh, like... A supergroup, and, and right. unless you know the supergroups would be and, and, and that would sell out in our day and age would be rap guys <laughs> or Justin Timberlake with the Christine Aguilera and Britney Spears all on one bill, and you know old rocker guys. I mean the supergroup things that that all stopped around the seventies and early eighties. Yeah, there were a few when grunge came out. It kind of kind of ruined everything in a way. Oh, it killed it, man. It's nice killed to it. have a different feel, but it really killed rock and roll, killed fashion. Basically, to me, rock and roll and fashion are, are one and the same because mm -hmm. all of the, all the Hendrix, the Who, and all of that stuff, they had really cool, they had cool images along with, you know, the music that they were exposing to generate, you know, uh, people that never heard stuff. I remember Cream coming out, and it was like, oh, this is the coolest stuff going on. But at the same time, you had Hendrix, The Who, Big Brother, and The Holden Company, and, you know, plus the Beatles were coming out with something new all the time. And, you know, there was just so much good music coming out at, at one time, and then Deep Purple came out, Led Zeppelin in the 70s. Actually, late 60s, early 70s, and then, you know, and to me, that's, that's some of the best music ever, and that's in our show. And so, it's uh, we don't we're we're not really a competitive mess uh, uh, against young rock bands, or when Motley Crue comes here to be a resident, or when Guns N' Roses came here. It's not a threat to our show because our show is a bunch of different material with a storyline and a history of all the bands that, that did that stuff. So, you know, people are going to bring their kids, their grandkids, and uh, once they see what it's about and know what it's about, it, it's like a 10 or 15 concerts in one. It's not just going to see Motley do, you know, that's why they can't, their residency here only lasts so long because there's only so many people that are going to come for six weeks or four or five weeks, however long they are here on a, on a regular basis, to see them, you know. Well, this and, uh, and the sure. show opens up the entire world of music and world of rock and roll, and you can interweave oh, totally. and stuff like and where totally. where you're saying the supergroup, they have this, and that's what they can play. This is what they play. Yeah, but exactly. You, you they can, come out, and you know what? If, if young people know who they are, you know, then they're going to attract young people. But the clubs here in Las Vegas, uh, they do better than some of the casinos. You know, young people go in, 10 or 15 of them, they all pitch in for a bottle that costs them, you know, maybe 500 to a grand to have a booth. You know, you get 10 people at, at 200 bucks a head, you know, and then, then, then it's just body to body. That's what the super groups are up against. You know, we're up against, uh, as, as a show here in Vegas, we're up against the Cirque shows. There's so many of them, and mm -hmm. they're so much alike. But they're great shows. 
our show right now is the number one show on TripAdvisory, and it's the, the number one show in Las Vegas right now because there aren't any other musical things that are going on. The Rock of Ages and and Frankie Marino is an incredible talent, but um, and he's one of the few people that gets to do his own material. But, but like I said, it's really tough to have a show here in Las Vegas because of all the advertisement you have to put up. Uh, there's over 200 and some shows here in Las Vegas. So if people really don't know about your show, they're going to go and see a third show or going to, you know. And people come here for three or four days and uh, they try to drink themselves and build bill of the house. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's just a... Uh, it's an amazing town. You know, locals, we hardly ever go to the Strip, you know, unless we go to see a show. But there's so many things to do outside of the Strip. And it's, um, I'm really grateful to be here. And uh, I'm really grateful for everything that's happened in my life. Uh, this show has given me a second, all oh, actually everyone here, a second uh, shot to a career. Because uh, they're talking about making... Um, doing some slot machines with raining the rock vault and with Ooh. images of us on there. That's our retirement for the rest of our lives when, the, when we don't do the show anymore. Well, you got to think about Because the, the show is like the Trans-Siberian Orchestra, except the difference is, is it can constantly evolve and change the material. So they're, they're talking about having different companies. Younger people can come in and take our place once once the show is really established and, uh, and people really understand what it's about, uh, because that's kind of the hardest thing right now is, is getting people to understand what the show is about because they get it a little confused with Rock of Ages or is it just a bunch of old guys up there playing song cover songs. No, there's so much going on. There's a VJ. Well, first of all, there's an AM DJ, and then he goes to FM when we go from the 60s, because it was AM radio. Uh -huh. When we go to the 70s, we have our own DJ, and, and he does, you know, the 70s DJ. And then we get to the 80s, now you're into MTV. So now we have a VJ. And then on the other side of the stage is a stage of this guy and these other actors who were going through the 60s of, you know, being drafted and the guy's girl leaving him uh, and getting involved in some kind of uh, a cult, uh, people against the war, and he has uh, basically a, a daughter he's never seen since he got back from Vietnam. And uh, there's another set on one side of the stage that uh, the actors inter you know, use and interact, and then on the other side, there's a whole a separate stage on the other side of the pyramid, which is the our stage. And uh, you know the uh, you have the D the DJ who is a real DJ, and uh, he talks about you know what was the best film in 19, late 1960s and 70s, and they talk about, you know, Patty Hearst and, uh, you know, that whole scene, and President Nixon getting impeached, and, you know, us landing on the moon, and all kinds of stuff, you know, that's incorporated in the show, that basically went on during the time this, these, these, this music came out, and then you intertwine that history and a history of the band on uh, with photos and stuff on the screens while we're performing the song so it gives people you know people who live through that time period are reliving it going down memory lane mm -hmm. and people who brought bringing their children and grandchildren are getting exposed to what Really, what rock and roll, how it started. Well, we must teach the young how to Starts rock. Starts out with these guys coming back to Earth a thousand years in, into the future, and they're in hazmat outfits, and they, they come to Earth, and they just, they discover the vault. And once they discover it, then it opens up a stargate, and we come in 
starting with my generation from the Who, we, we come into uh, the world through a Stargate a thousand years into the future. Because the Earth's already been destroyed and they found the rock vault. And you go through this journey of music and what was going on. Who was in office and they did this on the moon in this time period. All this happened, and, and, and ends uh, eventually ends in the show. The show sounds like it rocks. It really does. I mean, you've been in rock and roll a long time. What does it mean to be in Vegas and to doing this show and to have this opportunity? It's, uh, and... it's quite, quite, quite. I'm just so grateful to be a part of it. So grateful to to uh, to perform every night with such incredible talent on the stage and the band. It's just so tight. Everything is so tight. Well, you've long been considered a rock and roll legend. I mean, you've been around for a while. You went through Rough Cut, King Cobra. I mean, you did Hearing Aid back in the, you know, We're Stars back in the day. And how do you, how, your voice is still as strong as ever. How do you keep it going? How do you keep that, you know? I, I'm, I'm so just so grateful I still have a voice. And uh, let me okay. tell you, since I've been doing the show five nights a week, I've went to Robin McCauley and I've even hit him up, uh, it's never too late to uh, ask uh, another great singer for some pointers, and he's given me a few vocal lessons that uh, that has actually improved my voice immensely. And um, uh, I'm not too proud to say it because I, I, I think Rob is an incredible singer. Oh, yeah. So is Andrew, and uh, John Payne has an incredible range, and so I'm always picking their brain on... Uh, Hey man, how can I better myself? How can I better my my vocals? Well, that that leads me right up to my next question. I mean, um, who you being a legendary singer, who are your favorite vocalists that are out there in the world today? I mean, who do you like listening to or go? Well, I don't have anybody just favorite, but uh, I would say um, Paul Rogers is one of my favorite. Oh, Ronnie nice. James Dio, uh, David Coverdale. You know, but David Coverdale snagged his stuff from Robert Plant and um, and Paul Rogers. Uh, you know, I mean, they all did. Robert Plant snagged stuff from Paul Rogers. To me, Paul Rogers is probably the Frank Sinatra of rock and roll. He, he's the best phraser. He's as consistent as can be. Ronnie James Dio was a great rock singer. Glenn Hughes is a great rock singer. David Coverdale is probably one of my all-time favorites. I grew up actually listening to a lot of R&B, so give me David Ruffin from The Temptations. Give me Stevie Wonder. And that was the shit to me. I mean, uh -huh. you know, rock came from the blues. But yeah, those would be my favorite singers. Well, you get to jam with some of the all-time greats of rock and roll music. But of all the people that you jam with now and you jammed with in the past, you performed with, who have you not performed with that you really, really want to? Oh, God, to see um, Sammy Hager. I would love to jam with him. There's so many um, great players and singers out there. Uh, Steve Ferria, I would love to see him come out of retirement. And he, to me, is a reflection of Sam Cooke. Darling, you... You know, I mean, huh. he buries all over that. I would have never thought of that. Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that, that, huh. I, can, I can bet money that was probably one of his. Wouldn't idols. surprise me a bit. Now, on collaborating with other people, do you collaborate with everybody or do you yeah, just... Yeah, I, I, like I like to write with other people and do stuff. So you got any new um, projects on the horizon? I mean, besides uh, Raiding the Rock Vault? Well, I... Um, I've been working with this guy, David Chapman, who uh, has written some songs with Craig Goldie, and I sang a few songs on him, and uh, Benny of Apathy is, um, or Peace, um, which one is it? It's Carmine of Peace and Benny Apathy. <laughs> They're brothers, and they both have say their last name to Benny. Um, uh, and Benny uh, uh, Apathy is uh, playing drums on it. Another guy I would love to jam with, though, would be Rod Stewart. There's a guy that's been like Madonna that's just went through the years. Well, he's been able to adapt. I mean, you know, from Do You Think I'm Sexy back in the day to now he's doing the old standards, the old, you know, the old crooner type songs. 
and uh, he sounds really good doing them. That's what I would like to do. That's what I love to do. When I cut and sit in with somebody that performs here in town, I'm going to do like at last or something that's, you know, off the cuff, not rock and roll. Because I grew up listening to Gershwin and all those old standards that Rod's doing. I, I think that he's great doing it. We just saw Celine Dion. Unbelievable. Really? Unbelievable. Well, I mean, I've heard it, but I, I've always wanted I want to see Elton uh, show there, but I've seen Elton before. And he's a bit boring, but he's <laughs> so talented, and all the, all the songs you know, are so great. Well, I mean, he has so many hits. They're just hit after hit after hit. Now, on uh, bringing it up to today, is there any new rock that you listen to that's out there that you, you know, you're really getting into? Not really. I'm a dinosaur. I've listened to some of the Nickelback. There's a few bands out there, but... But what about, like, uh, the new country? Some of that, you know, the hard stuff. Back in the day, it would have been considered rock and roll, but now it's like new country, like the Jason Aldean. Do you listen to uh, a lot of that? Oh, yeah. You know, uh, Keith Urban, Toby Keith, man, those guys are brilliant. Jim McGraw, man, I mean, really, they really are. It's like it's like all the wrong guitar players decided to go to Nashville because now they're making pick again. <laughs> well, it seems to be the case in a lot of... I love Megan of... Rich. Well, they've got that that carnival style atmosphere. It's almost rock and roll. Well, unfortunately, we have run out of time. So, Paul Shortino, rock legend, thank you very much for me and from all of us at SRO Magazine for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come on and and I mean talk with us. If there's anything we can ever do for you, man, all you got to do is pick up the phone and uh, call SRO. You got it. Much love to you. All right, brother. You have an excellent day. And, man, take care. Bye-bye. That was Paul Shortino, the illustrious rock legend, and we'd like to thank him for taking the time out of his busy schedule to come on and talk to us at SRO Magazine. If you want more information about either Paul Shortino or Raiding the Rock Vault, you can simply go to their websites, and that's paulshortino.com. Or RaidingTheRockVault.com, and it is located at the LBH Hotel Casino in lovely Las Vegas, Nevada. And for all your rock and entertainment news, you know where to go. Go to SRO, SRO Magazine. That's SROMAGINC.com. SRO Magazine. You can find SRO Magazine on both Facebook and Twitter. My name is Ferg, your humble rock and roll correspondent, and I am on there as well, and we'd like to thank Johnny Voice. You're welcome, Ferg. And remember, SRO Magazine says, be strong and rock on. I'm gone.